Thank you to Howard again, and over to you. Paul, thank you very much. I just want to check, can everyone see my screen? Paul is... Uh, is yes. Okay, I, thanks. I can see Excellent. it. Yeah. And then I think I, I, we sort of see people from all over the world. Ken and Jatta and Ibrahim. Ibrahim, I, I believe, are you from our Saudi class earlier this week? Yes, yeah. Ah, fantastic. <laughs> lovely no, to hear you, no. lovely to see you again, fantastic. Okay, so yeah, we had a, we had a really nice um, chat last week and um, I've certainly been spending time with Paul Krobler going through the different aspects of, of knowledge management and we do understand that it's actually quite difficult uh, to to grasp and to get everyone to to see it what what we did do um and i i'll just share a brief story with you is we actually um we spent some time with with someone called lex den i don't know if any of you have heard of lex den and he runs a he's sorry i'm just trying to get my my screen to move one Okay, uh, I was multi-failing there. My apologies. Okay, so he he's built um, the digital twin, and he's built the digital twin of the DM Bach, um, and a lot of it's about knowledge management. And he he had a, a session with us. We actually spent two hours with him on on I think it was Friday of last week. And we really spoke about how do we how do we ensure that we all have common understanding within the organization. Um, and Lex was very passionate and very excited about this and felt that there had to be almost this quite, I wouldn't say dictatorial, that's not, that's not the right word, that's certainly not what he meant, but it is about paying lots of attention to everybody, uh, extracting their knowledge, uh, collaborating with their knowledge and adding it to a knowledge management system that has all the principles, a knowledge graph. And I'm sure you've seen some of the comments on the knowledge graph from last week. Um, and Paul Krobler and I spent quite a bit of time talking about it. And, and we had this question that, that we sort of would love to get some answers and maybe some feedback from you is, is why, why is it that people are not seeing the value of knowledge graphs, knowledge management within the organization. Is it, is it something that we don't understand? Do we, do we not properly see the value of it? Is it something, for example, that the DMBOC doesn't really describe and therefore we, we're not recognizing this knowledge management? So I was interested if any, if any of you are having the similar problem to me in getting people excited. Now, and I'll, I'll just give you a, a thing with Paul Krobler. If I've been talking to him four months, five months, maybe longer, six months about knowledge management. And he just, it took him so long. And only now he's coming around to say, oh, I can I actually see some value and I can I could get excited. Um, but up until then, it's, up until then, it's been heavy slog, lots of work. And I can see here that I think it's Lafiki said uh, knowledge management is still not understood within organizations and, and I agree with you. It's, it's not understood. But when we talk to people, and I know Ibrahim, when I talked to him in the, in the class about um, corporate memory, about looking after it and stuff like that, we still don't feel that people recognize it almost as an asset. and. I, I was interested to see anyone if anyone had a insight in terms of why why none of our corporations are interested in this and Debbie and I were talking this morning in terms of why do we have so few people attending this course and she said no she's convinced that because it's document and content um, and not many people are excited so I was just wondering if anyone had a view of um, what it is that we need to do to convince our organizations and 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 hopefully you can see from the screen is i'm sort of taking it from a cdo level that has to get that uh commitment from the stakeholders to explain why it's so important any anyone like to share an experience or something like that as to 
why are we battling to get this settled into our organizations? We all know data quality, metadata, master data, all those things everyone everyone's raving about and, and that, but why why not knowledge management? Anyone anyone have an idea? Ty? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna give it a shot, um, Howard. Um, sure. about in about the year two thousand, I attended um 2000, 2001, 2002, lots of international conferences. Yeah. And one of the things that excited me was the business rules yes. uh, conferences yes. with Ronald Ross. Yes. And I think business rules is about uh, knowledge. Um, his, his definition is a business rule is a statement that defines or constrains some aspects of the business and his approach was very much a, a top down so this is the strategy what are the tactics um, yeah. and it was all about getting out the rules for uh, how the business operates and so it was about corporate memory it was about um, a common understanding and I I've been excited about it for 20 years and I think it has a link to this um, to document and content management. But yeah. again, let's put document and content management in the middle and maybe we see it differently, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. So, so Di, what, what makes you, and, and I suppose this is my real where I'm puzzled, is, is why doesn't anyone get excited by it? Um, <laughs> we've, got a, <laughs> we've got a few people here. Yeah. We struggled for several years um, um, at Old Mutual, where we were working at the time, and we we just we couldn't sell the idea of yeah. this is how we should do it. And, yeah. and we were selling data quality, and we were trying to link the two. Um, yeah, so it was a, a a very hard sell, which is why I'm excited about this topic because maybe it's a way. Yeah. A way to, to sell it mm. and and or, certainly or convince them that it's yeah. a need mm. right and and certainly last week we we spoke of when we develop these uh taxonomies and ontologies that represent our knowledge our corporate knowledge um now that they are machine readable we, we can now start getting machines to help us build sort of inferences to, to infer knowledge and to infer, infer insights and deduce knowledge. So um, we, we've now got a, a, such an amazing facility where the machines can almost in a way, if we, if we build the ontology and we add it to OWL or OWL, machines can start to understand it. We can, we can guide them and they can keep on informing us what we didn't understand, what needs to be understood. And that must be, it, it is such a powerful scenario, but um, hopefully, hopefully we, we get that to add more value. Any, anybody else have a, have a view on, on why we're battling so much? Okay. <coughs> yes, yes. The Good Fiki, is that? Hi, how are you Max doing? Ling. It's Max Ling. Uh, Max Ling. Ling. How, you, how are you doing? Uh, I'm good. I'll attempt to give it a shot. Okay, um, fantastic. <laughs> first and foremost, um, you know, what I've seen happen is that um, KM, you know, it normally falls falls short or it gets lost in, lost in translation in between information you know, yeah. in, in between information and data. So that's the first point where I've seen where, you know, it, it, it falls short. And secondly, I mean, in my head, I've, I've developed, um, you know, an, an analogy to say, and which is something that I learned um, as I was uh, beginning my KM journey, is that uh, all these concepts, they are different concepts, starting from data, which gets translated into into information 
yeah. and eventually transfer, uh, transformed into knowledge of which when eventually when you do use um, the knowledge coupled with the data, you you know, sometimes arrive at, at, at innovation. You know, yeah. so that's the picture that, um, you know, I've, I've painted and it's the picture that I've been um, selling in the organizations right. where I'm, I'm currently uh, based, you okay. know, so and it still is um, an issue. I mean, funny enough, it's even a concept that's been toyed. It doesn't have a home, you know, in my current environment because yes. the one person thinks it must go to strategy. The next person uh -huh. thinks it must go to business development, yeah. you know, so it, it still it still is, is an issue in terms of finding a home. But I mean, I mean the, yeah. based on 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 where on on some of my previous um organizations where i found um km within the research department you know in order to assist it um you know to arrive you know to innovation at some point so, yes. so it is that you know to say that you know it gets lost in between the various discussions that are happening within the organization as well as um people not seeing the true value because it's it's not even something that you can even touch and show the next person you right. know so i think right. that's where um some of the issues are thanks okay that's a link that that's that's good and i like what you said because i've actually got uh, a couple of points on on the slide where people are, are having lots of debates also is is it about hr because um when people Re resign or, or leave. Um, one of the things that they they are asking is, what sort of exit and and transfer of knowledge are we are we paying attention to? So should HR be looking after it? Should HR also be looking after when they look after our career planning and the growth of knowledge within the organisation? Should it also be an HR thing? So so that's another view that some people have. That's true. I mean, everybody tends to look at what really benefits them in the whole pie, in my view. Yes. For instance, you just mentioned HR. HR might be interested in, in, in retention, for argument's sake. Yes. Yes. Whereas when you're looking at marketing, business development, research, you know, everybody else wants um, a certain thing, um, you know, from that. However, they're not looking at it from a holistic perspective. Right, right. Yeah. You're right. Uh, and you know, and I th I'm hoping and I'm praying that with these type of discussions and also with when AI starts to and machine learning really starts to help us contribute to the knowledge and we can start to get those insights, then then, then it gets exciting. And the digital twin is, is a very exciting area where um, the, the concept of the digital twin, for example, and they and they Lex uh, Den Duop has built, has built a digital twin of the DM buck. Um, and and what he's able to do is then is then when you're working within an organization, if you set it up, he can then uh, help with practices and people can collaborate and define a good practice within their organization and then help with associating any form of documents to that uh, to that process. Let's say it's a data quality profiling for for Dyes thing. And then this is how we do it. So the communities of practice should be contributing to it, and and we should all be building it. Um, now he he gets really passionate and feels that we have to start at the top and then almost dictate the level of knowledge management. So it's, it's it is exciting and and let's take it a little bit further. But thanks, Di and Metzeling for for contributing. Um, let me see if I can if I can share a little bit of excitement. Uh, I do believe that our executives need to carry this flag. They, they need to be able to build a business case as to why we need it um, and hopefully convince the other executives that, that it's worthwhile. So, but based on that, let's let's go through the content and would really appreciate any, any engagement and, and discussion wherever we can. Okay. Great. So these are the these are the different areas that I'd look at, and I wanted to start off with um, the almost the definition of what is knowledge, and and there's something that I really learned in 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 today, um, 
as I always spoke about the conversion of tacit knowledge to explicit knowledge, um, and I've always missed this implicit knowledge. And, and uh, it really dawned on me uh, over the weekend when I was preparing and how much I had, I had left out. But it was good that Matsaling brought up the transformation when we go from data to information to knowledge and wisdom. That's that sort of uh, dikwa that, that lots of people refer to. And also interestingly enough is that each one of these areas become data. They become data to help us uh, get to that next level. So this is quite an interesting set of discussions that we have. Um, and I'm not sure why it's getting cut off. Let me, that's funny. Okay, so definition, uh, can you see it there, Paul? Can you see that whole screen or is it just my uh, screen that's cutting it off on the edge? No, we can see the whole thing. Ah, thank you very much. So the definition of knowledge, um, knowledge is information and abilities acquired through human experience and education. Okay, so it's it's adding to the data and information. And, and so we from the information that we get, we then start adding to this abilities acquired f with the human experience and education. So so we we really need people to contribute this component to us um, and and help us build the knowledge management system. So th that's one definition which was quite interesting. When I went to Google, um, Google Wikipedia, they also had had a, a definition which I liked as well. So it's a familiarity, awareness, or understanding of someone or something, such as facts, skills, or objects. Uh, by most accounts, knowledge can be acquired in many different ways and from many sources, including but not limited to perception. All right, so, so that's almost what we refer to as our tacit knowledge. Uh, reasoning, memory, testimony, scientific inquiry, education, and practice. Now, that's what we're trying to harness and that's what we're trying to bring about is, is appended to our information that we built data and information, we need to append the knowledge and this understanding. And I, I was wondering if any of you remember the, the sort of discussion we had in, in the BI session when we spoke about Barry Devlin has that business and intelligence book. And he said, we, we sometimes battle with decision making because people's experiences get them to see things differently and bring about a certain bias. So we're trying to get everybody to see things in the same way. So, and but notice here that it's not, it's, it's, it also includes the perception, reasoning, and memory. Now, another definition. Now, so this is facts, information, and skills acquired through experience or education. So notice now that we we seeing specialists our data citizens that are gaining this experience on an ever increasing um, scale when they're analyzing the information, when they're, an when they're working with machines and, and getting insights, uh, they are developing this experience and education. Theoretical or practical understanding of a subject. And then if we have synonyms, we see here uh, understanding, comprehension, grasp, mastery. Okay. And so how do we how do we bring about a mastery of the domain that we're in? And how do we convert this in knowledge into data that machines can use? Uh, the next one is awareness or fam familiarity gained by experience of a fact or situation. Now that one was also exciting because that is all about that when we when we spoke about big data analysis, I don't know if any of you have seen my a diagram, the Kinefin diagram, that talks about um, the different quadrants, and it's all about uh, understanding that different areas have a different knowledge. And so our obvious area in the Kinefin diagram is a simple cause and effect. So we know that the experience or the, 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 the situation, what caused it, when we see the effect, we know the cause. That's simple. And then when we go into, into the uh, complex environment, then 
we see an effect. Uh, we do have experts that know the cause, but not everyone's completely in agreement. So we have to confirm our thinking. When we're going to complicate it, there is no uh, well-known cause and effect. So we start using hypotheses and we probe. So we, we go through the AI process of probing to see if we've understood the cause or we've, we've addressed the cause. And, and when we see the right effect coming about or the addressing it, then, then we know we've, we've sort of established a cause and effect. So we're trying to get people to, with their knowledge, when they got the knowledge, they can see the cause and effect. And hopefully that explains what we're trying to achieve in this area of knowledge. Okay, so this is then important in terms of, well, how do I differentiate experience versus information? Um, so let's just give a simple example. We have revenue analytics show that the sales of a clothing brand has declined. And I'm sure a few of you have seen me talk about having the different metrics. We measure the metrics um, and then we need we need some system to help us explain it. So we should be, if we've had declining sales, we should go be going back to uh, the, the business and saying, why did it happen? Okay, so remember there's those questions, what happened? Oh, we've had a decline in sales. Then we have to say, why did it happen? Um, and this was quite an interesting example here because they said, oh, the marketing team gather and this is Matsaling. This is where we talk about uh, other experiences to discuss bad revenue results. They had a long conversation and decided that the reason for the decline is that their chief fashion designer has lost his touch. Um, this conclusion can be considered knowledge because it's it's a result of conversation. So there's an interesting thing coming through here. Um, would any machine be able to find this? That, that, that would be challenging, but when people sit down and talk about it and through their experience and understanding, they've noticed that the chief fashion designer is not on the top of his game and, and losing touch. So it's quite interesting if, if we were there to take this to a machine, would it come up with the same answer? I somehow doubt that we'd have the right input or information um, to see this and to pick it up, but a difficult, a difficult thing to to work through. Okay, so some other attributes of knowledge. We have high value knowledge and low value knowledge, um, and I like this definition as well to say the term knowledge is normally only applied to high value insights. So, sort of when you when you look at when you look at some of the graphs or when you look at some of your trends. And, and you really see value on that, then you deem that to be to, you deem that to be knowledge. Um, whereas if your coworker tells you a great deal about what they had for breakfast or the driving to work, you might consider that information and too much information um, as opposed to knowledge. Okay, so that was an interesting differentiation. And then we've also got this thing of difficult to transfer versus easy to transfer. And as knowledge managers, we, we have to recognize this difference. Um, so information can be represented as data. This means it can be easily stored and transferred by information technology or person to person. Some knowledge is difficult to transfer person to person or represent as data. And now this leads us into this discussion of tacit knowledge and I, misunderstood this. I, I knew that tacit knowledge was in my head. It was my understanding or what Barry Devlin refers to my biases, but it's also a tacit knowledge. And one of the one of the, the, the definitions that they have is to say tacit knowledge is the knowledge that is difficult to write down, visualize or transfer from one person to another. And and I, I've never seen that definition and I've and I've almost used the implicit definition or, or the definition of implicit knowledge and I've, and I've termed it tacit knowledge. But I have known about this situation of saying there's some things that's really hard. For example, how do I teach someone to speak a language? Um, and specifically for me, that's terrible at languages. <laughs> 
I, I would love to have uh, someone give me a recipe on how do you learn Arabic, for example. Maybe Ibrahim can can help me, but it's it's not easy. Um, and and I come into different countries that are speaking a different language, and I really battle to to pick up the words and and to pick up the sounds. And it would be nice if we had a recipe, but that doesn't exist. Yeah, we've got some rules written down somewhere, but can I go and read the rules and speak the language? No, typically what's required is I need to be immersed in the culture, immersed in the environments. I've got to come and uh, spend time and live with uh, the Saudis and, and get to understand that language. Otherwise, I'll just hear bits and pieces on the side and I won't, and I won't understand. The other one is innovation, and Mr. Leng spoke about that. Innov innovation is elusive skill. Can everybody innovate? Or, and then, so you'll find some people that innovate all the time, and then others that battle to innovate, and and that's okay. Um, but what is that difference? And is that and that sort of tacit knowledge? We also talk about leadership. Uh, can you teach leadership? Yeah, you can. You can sort of give some rules and guidelines, but. The number of leadership books I've read sometimes actually get quite dis distressing or disappointing because that everyone's got a new way of becoming a great leader or the top 10 things. Um, then we've got an aesthetic sense. So aesthetic explains why art and culture is appealing. Another one that I battle with. <laughs> it's, I seem to battle with quite a few of these. Um, selling. Um, so for example, Paul Bolton does a great job of, of selling. But I, I don't, on the other hand, I'm, I'm not that good at that, at that level. And so finally, I get to understand this is that if we, and, and we had other examples like riding a bicycle. Um, I always have a personal experience there that my brothers and that, we all got our bicycles at nine years old. My brothers picked up the bicycles pretty quickly and started riding. I think it took me three weeks to learn how to ride a bicycle. There was lots of falling and, and things like that. So. It took me. It took me some time, and it is this thing of of tacit knowledge. The hardest part of knowledge management is transferring tacit knowledge to explicit knowledge. Um, and and I and I hadn't really framed that in my mind. Now, implicit knowledge, which is which is really exciting, and I think this is something we don't do, um, but we we do remember uh, episodes, for example, with Toyota. And, and the Japanese that interest, that introduced total quality management die. I'm sure you you've heard of that, where they had these after action reports. And this after action reports is actually a military term. Um, and I did quite a bit of reading in terms of of um, how the military use it. So what they do is they've actually got a knowledge manager that when when a group of people go out, and they have a contact with with whoever it is. When they come back, there's a knowledge manager that sits with these people before they disperse, and extracts the knowledge. And it was used by air, uh, pilots in the Second World War. It was used by submarine captains to um, explain what they had discovered in their ventures and their journeys. And they went through all of this process of. Um, extracting the knowledge from the people and it was a skilled knowledge manager that extracted the knowledge and got it committed into a knowledge management system and i must admit i haven't seen anybody certainly in all the projects that i've done there's no knowledge manager saying ah after the end of this project what went right what went wrong we we certainly have those those type of uh, meetings but where does it get captured and does it go back into our corporate memory so that we don't make the mistake again? I, I, I think we've we keep on repeating the mistake. Um, so there's always too many things um, immediately demanding that person's attention after action. So we've got to get a, a someone skilled in knowledge management and they have a responsibility to debrief and separate all the different noise that they're getting the wheat from the shaft, chaff to create a report and ensure that the lessons are captured and then disseminated. So again, uh, we ask ourselves is how many times do we do this in after action on a sprint or a data profiling or building a data strategy or whatever we do, we, we need to be capturing this. Yes, Di.
Sorry, Di, I can't hear you. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm a, a, a big practitioner of this. And just um, last week, I ran a, a training course, and I ran it like I run every course. I have my pencil and paper next to me and my checklist, and I record everything that I need to improve or anything that's right. a anything that's a quirk and tomorrow I'll have my debrief with uh, my bosses um, and we'll apply those learnings into the next course so uh, it, you've got to live this stuff and yeah. practice it um, yeah thank you excellent and, and I think you know, Paul Bolton has, has also put something here in, in my uh, baking bread so I, I think about a year and a half ago, Debbie Debbie's taught me how to bake bread. Um, well, I actually tried to learn on baking bread or sourdough bread on, on the videos, and, and I had many disasters. Uh, and then I was able to get Debbie up just to to show me, and, and because those videos go so quickly, and the actual folding of the bread, it, it just went, it went pear-shaped, and, and I... And the whole idea of baking that bread was was trying to see what does it take to build a recipe and what does it take to build the knowledge, um, and and that was that wasn't easy when you look at an expert and you watch them folding bread and then when you try uh, it gets stuck on your hands and you can't get this bread off and a number of times I I nearly put the bread in the bin because I was I was losing it and I wasn't um, working with it that's the important thing uh, but then when you talk to experts they almost don't know what they're doing and and, and in some cases they battle to explain ah oh, but you got to you got to do this and this and this to actually get it right so and and so how do we get that tacit knowledge of the expert into the floor into the into the organization so that we don't lose that we don't lose that knowledge I mean, that's important knowledge especially when we interpreting graphs and looking for insights and making decisions and actions what are we doing why 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 did it work and why didn't it work those those are the important things and we should be associating them with our data and information okay so let's go on to the next area which which is um what is knowledge management and what i found quite interesting is i must have found about 10 or 12 different definitions of knowledge management all of them have a part to play all of them seem very exciting and 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 worthwhile um and so i wanted to just take you through some of the examples there's some from gartner and they they also brought it in when when knowledge management as Dai was saying was such a big thing um so someone, there's this lady, uh, Anna Ma, that, that wrote a lot of this in, in a website called Simplicable. I actually quite liked her writing. And she, she says, knowledge management is the practice of identifying, creating, communicating, socializing, memory, measuring, and improving knowledge to support strategic objectives. Now, that must be fantastic uh, if we can get that right, where um, the, the information that we're keeping that will help us achieve our strategy is being documented and, and put together and helping others join and support the, the strategy. Um, so we, we know that we develop all these fancy strategies, but how do we get there and how do we ensure that those strategies become sustainable and become part of our everyday life. How do we apply our knowledge to that strategy? Um, it's, it's, it's not easy and we need the help and the guidance and we need people to capture it and add it there for us. And then there was somebody else. This, this is from the, the Gartner Group in 1998. So we've been uh, working in this knowledge management for a while. And I always ask myself the question, why is it that knowledge management isn't in the DM box? Why, why aren't we referring to this, uh, the process? And so their definition, and they call it enterprise, uh, part of enterprise information asset management. So knowledge management is a discipline 
that promotes an integrated approach to identifying, capturing, evaluating, retrieving, and sharing all of the enterprise information assets. These assets may include databases, documents, policies, procedures, and previously uncaptured expertise and experience in individual workers. So this was this was a a, a definition by Gartner, and I've never seen it come into the DMBOC. Um, and we uh, lots of us talk about this data information knowledge and wisdom, but I'm sure like like me. I'm, I'm very comfortable on getting information. If I've got data in the database, I then can add context like master data and all my dimensions. I get information. I then, we then do some forecasting and, and understanding on the why, but this knowledge side is has got me baffled for, for some time. Um, okay, another definition, and this was from engineering management, which is also, so we've got the, the engineering people jumping on it the IEEE, and they say knowledge management is a method to simplify and improve the process of creating, sharing, distributing, capturing, and understanding knowledge in a company. So once more, that knowledge is seen as an asset. We, we, we should be able to um, extract that information from people. We should be able to uh, share it and distribute so that uh, people that just join the company come in and they can go somewhere and get hold of the corporate memory, get hold of the terms they use, get hold of the way in which they perform certain tasks. So to me, it's not just about the rules, and I agree rules are part of it, but it's also about how do we get better at the processes we do? How do we ensure that when somebody leaves, we don't start again and, and we start trying to find, we do a quick Google on on give me the top 10 tips on building a data strategy. But but Howard was here three months ago and he was building data strategies and now all that information has gone. What, what do we do? Surely we we wasting a lot of time and money by not bringing these assets into play. So here's another definition on how to create value that leads to advantage. And now we're talking about business advantage. So the challenge of knowledge management is how to generate and leverage collective knowledge in the firm to create value that leads to competitive advantage. So what's what are our what are our competitors doing? What have we done that gave us that competitive edge? What do we con need to continue to do to give us the competitive edge? And how do we collect all this knowledge that's going to benefit the organization? Okay, so this was in 27, an empirical assessment of performance impacts of uh, IS support for knowledge transfer. So this is information systems or well, that decision support uh, process. Okay, how to improve organizational learning capabilities within the organization. So another definition comes about knowledge man management is about harnessing the intellectual and social capital of individuals in order to improve the organizational learning cap capabilities. And I always like this idea of, of, of the challenge that we have when we build people strategies and we want to uh, in, increase the speed at which a, a, not a junior, that's probably not the right term, but a, uh, an, a, a new person comes into the area, they, they may have all sorts of other skills, but how, how long does it take for us to get that person to a specialist within the area? Does it take five years, 10 years, 15 years? Um, and why is it that we have to start in the beginning with each person? And, the, and, and of course, a lot of the learning happens as part of uh, on-the-job learning. We, we know that that's critical, but they should be able to go somewhere and say, this is how we've done it in the past. This is how we achieved success. This is how we failed. So please don't do that again. Um, and we need to be able to, to get people to go into the right direction. Okay, deriving knowledge from information, that's, that's been the common one, data information, knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge management is responsible for providing the assessment of and the accessibility to refined information, i.e. knowledge. So what this definition is saying is, is we have to uh, assess using those after action report techniques and allow people access to it, the sort of Google search, um, to this knowledge. 
so we have to find ways of cataloging it and i was i was hoping that you know people would recognize that one of the ways and the techniques we do it is by building an ontology and the ontology is that study of what exists or what we believe we know to exist and yes it is going to be different by each organization but we we should know and we should have the tools and techniques to do it um fortunately these people have been talking about it since 2011 27 to 2007 and gartner and 1997 so they've also it's taken a while for me to see it as well they may be frustrated um okay so so the components of knowledge i i like this as well it's not just about it's not just about the, the 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 knowledge we have or the ontology. So notice it is about the content, and the content is both records in a database and records in documents. So so that is content, um, but it is important to have the expertise location. So um, how do we get access to an expert to explain something that we're not sure of? And Debbie was one of those experts that could help me. And the difference between watching a video and watching a person and then telling you was phenomenal. So, so how do we how do we get this peop these people connected? And then, so we have to have the experts available, um, teams, and that is great. And then it's about capturing the lessons learned, or um, what we refer to as is after action reports. And then it's about the communities of practice like this, this very situation where we should be discussing knowledge management and we should be understanding and suggesting ways in which we can capture the knowledge. And I can, I'm just looking at some of the people's names here, uh, people like Johan that have got tremendous knowledge in financial markets. I was so fortunate to be able to go and talk to him and, and tell him, ask him to explain to me, what does this mean? How do I calculate this? If it hadn't been for Johan, I don't think I would have made it through building some of those data warehouses. So this is what's important to us, and we have to keep on uh, working on it and building it. So what are the phases of knowledge management? These are the phases. So we we can, and this is where I think most of us are. We, we, we think we got uh, SharePoint. SharePoint is installed, and now we have knowledge. Um, so... Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of the times we stop there um, and we may have this scenario of, oh, if we've got SharePoint, if we've built it, then they will use it. Then all of a sudden we'll get the knowledge from SharePoint. Now, the person that, that Di mentioned, Ronald Ross, he's built lots of taxonomies that integrate into SharePoint. So he's actually one of the masters of those taxonomies. Um, and I've just seen a question from Jatta. Uh, listening to these descriptions begs the question, does knowledge management become an underlying principle for data, man data and information maturity in an organization? And I believe so, Chapter, and, and I'll show you some of the knowledge management maturity levels that, that have been built and defined. I, I'll give you an example. Um, but I think it should be. I think I, I certainly believe that knowledge management should be an area that as data and information management we pay attention to. I hope that answers your question. Was it Mornay? Sorry. Okay. All right, so, so we've got information technology. That's typically where we start. We think we're going to install a, KM, uh, a knowledge management system, a KMS, like SharePoint, and then they will use it and everyone will get clever. Uh, unfortunately, we don't go that far. Then we go into people and culture, and we've got to understand the search experience. And, and I can see the great strides that SharePoint's taken, but it's nowhere near that of Google that we almost, most of us use as our knowledge bank. Um, so what is this, the search experience? What is our ability to share the knowledge, and how do we create these communities of practice? So that tends to be the next focus area on our knowledge management delivery roadmap. And um, I, I really like this because, of course, you guys can see the next step, which is taxonomies and content and, and ontologies. And they said, well, if uh, you know, there's no use if they can't find it. OK, so if, if we don't have the skills of defining the controlled vocabularies that have the synonym rings and all those type of things, well, they, they can't find their things. and um, they don't get the answers they need. 
and and I have noticed that, and I've noticed sometimes people battling to find things on Google, um, and then you sometimes worry, wonder about why was it so easy for me to find, and and they were battling, and it's and, it, and it's about knowing the right terminology, it's about um, using the right words, and and almost like a week and a half ago, I was looking for videos to share with my data management training. And the difference between searching for data management and information management in the different types of videos. And because I knew those possibilities, it was good to see the, the change. So we've, we've got to find a way of ensuring that they can find it. Um, and then we get to the, the, the structuring of our knowledge and providing machine readable knowledge. And there was a great comment on LinkedIn today from Dion Bands who said, uh, the image was really nice from last week, but what about the machines that continue to mine this? And of course, they, they tell us what we don't know. So the machine should be able to look at new content and say, oh, but you weren't aware of this, or maybe there's something wrong with it. Um, and now we're looking at analytics, machine learning, I know I really enjoyed hearing him talk about the bread expertise. I think that's really awesome that he's uh, sharing with how we can all come together and share our knowledge together to be stronger together. Absolutely, I'm back. Gibbs. Ah, you're back. <laughs> Yay. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, let me just share my screen. Debs, did you answer all the questions? Did I answer all the questions? No. Yeah. No, <laughs> okay. I didn't, but I tried. Ah, okay, cool. I was hoping. Okay, so I think we, why do we need to manage knowledge? Hopefully I've, I've already sort of contributed to a lot of that. Um, and let's go into the principles of knowledge management. And these are the 14 principles that, that I've picked up. Um, okay, so so I I must admit I I like principles. I like to have an understanding of why am I doing something, what what's important to me. Um, the principles help me set the guidelines and the processes. So helpful to have that. Um, helpful to be aware of of what it is that you're trying to achieve. And bottom line is knowledge management principles are enduring sets of guidelines for managing knowledge that are established by an organization or a team so we shouldn't rewrite these principles or we shouldn't have to constantly rework them once we're there and we've established them within our organization they should last for some time we may need to change a policy or a procedure or a standard but we shouldn't have to change our principles um, Okay, so here's an example of some of the principles for, for knowledge management. And, and, and when you read this, you sort of, you sort of think that it, it, it looks like the DM Bock, where we said data is an asset. Of course, knowledge is a valuable asset, and one, would, one should ensure that, infer that um, knowledge is more valuable than data. Um, so knowledge management is based on the idea that knowledge is an asset and should be managed accordingly. And, and we know that from data management. Knowledge is stored in a central repository. And this is one of the challenges that we have is how do we find a common ontology that we can use that pe that will house people's knowledge and to be able to contribute and make it explicit and, and define it into some form of ontology. Uh, knowledge must be retained um, according to organizational attention period. And that was also exciting that I learned that um, we have to define almost knowledge has a half-life, okay? With, with the way we're seeing things operate, um, the knowledge that you had about doing data warehousing as, as, as a great example, things have changed dramatically now in terms of the new ways of doing it, the data lake, the extract, instead of ETL, now it's extract, load, and transform. Um, so, so they're very different techniques. We're looking at data vault, we're looking at anchor modeling, 
We're looking at using some of the cloud, the streaming and ingesting data. So I, I believe uh, data warehousing, what we knew five, six years ago is we've, we've had that half-life. We've, we've, we've progressed past it within data warehousing. Um, and certainly if, if you're looking at all the new stuff, you would uh, agree with that as to say, wow, the way we did it some time back is, is, is archaic and it takes too long. Knowledge must be quality controlled. This is specifically for DAI. Um, I'd love to see DAI's data quality dimensions of knowledge. Um, I've actually got some, so uh, I was going to test DAI on that. <laughs> <laughs> so we we must set the expectation that knowledge is quality controlled. And I like that thing on uh, uh, Wikipedia or WikiLeaks where we confirm the knowledge. So people make a post and, and we have to confirm that this knowledge is correct. Is it out of date? Um, do we have to dispose this knowledge? Do we have to redo the way we do things? We, we need a sustainable approach to our knowledge management. Uh, so whilst it's stored in a central area, it is decentralized. It is uh, about building an ontology for a team or what we call micro vocabularies and then rolling that together in, in, a, in a wider form. Knowledge is sociable, is social, right? So it's no use sitting there. It's got to get to the people that are using it. Otherwise, we, we're just wasting time. Um, knowledge is more valuable when it's accessible to a wide audience. Privacy and confidentiality prevent most organizations from sharing all knowledge. And we have to find ways of, of overcoming that. Um, okay, so if we take a little bit of a, a quick look at, at our, our knowledge maturity, and the idea is to, most of us sit in this dysfunctional state and, and we want to get to bliss. So these are these are the um, sort of levels that, that I found, and I, and I actually quite like them, they, they're quite challenging. And notice that we're starting from the worst situation we can be in. We then go into island, where, where we have silos or we have a single individual, we can then start to establish common common knowledge, uh, really important in terms of that. Um, and then we've got, uh, so it's a common knowledge, all knowledge is maintained in a common repository. Sharing happens at some basic level. We then create a sharing culture um, where we see the principles are in place. Knowledge sharing is common objective of the firm. Even at the top, they're sharing information and we have knowledge sharing tools. Um, and then we understand the strategic value of knowledge to where we get to the end is, is the improvement. Um, and we're constantly improving our knowledge. So we're improving the processes, the practices, the after action reports. We're constantly collecting this knowledge and trying to improve on it. Okay, so that's a that's a structure that I that I spoke about in terms of of ah Debbie, do you have a question? Hi, yes. Um, I just wanted to ask what leaky maturity uh, level is. What is leaky? Uh, well, if you were to guess, Debbie, what would it be? Unstable. Unstable? Uh, is that a little bit like your your sourdough starter or? <laughs> okay. I mean, she's stable with love. Yeah. Okay. So leaky means that you you're constantly leaking knowledge. Your organization builds knowledge. The people go, and then it leaks. So you got this bucket of knowledge when people are there, but then they leave, and it, and it's a leaky knowledge. So so I would think that um, a lot of us are sitting almost between this leaky and island type of scenario uh, yeah. until yeah. the island disappears. Yep. Okay. I see, I see. Thank you. Okay. Cool. All right. So let's go on. And this is this is one for Dai. Dai, you got some special questions here. So I hope you're on your game. So we remember the dimensions we spoke about, where we have the main dimension, the underlying concept, and you can see these ones over here, and then we have a metric that measures it. Okay. So this is what we've done for DQ, and Di can teach on it probably with her eyes closed. But I'd like to then have a look at how do we measure knowledge management. And Matsaleng, I'd be interested in if you've done any of this. 
And these are the dimensions of data quality or KM quality measures. So we've got accessible. Now we know that uh, that's certainly measured by our DQ accessibility, accessible and available. Fast knowledge, that means that it's timeliness. So we're not getting knowledge stuck in, in areas that it takes a long time to get through. And it's almost talking about what's going, what's trending. So if we think of uh, Snapchat or Instagram, we, we've got the what's trending. Um, and then we're going to integrated knowledge. So the knowledge has been um, sh uh, integrated into our business processes. And Di, this is one for you. I, I wasn't sure what um, DQ dimension we would fit that in. Uh, there's, there are a couple of possibilities, but any any idea from your side? So I think you may be on on mute, but okay. So the definition is that it's it's all the knowledge is connected to our processes. So the idea is, and and I'm sure you guys have seen these new things on on Teams when you're doing a work or performing a task. You can get the knowledge that you require for that specific step. If you're doing a data profiling and you've got a set of steps like following a recipe for this one area, I can say, please, can you tell me what to do here? I'm stuck. And then that's what we're trying to do in terms of integration. Um, but I'm not sure of the DQ dimension. I'll need to look at it. Diverse. Um, and they, they explain that what is our coverage across all of our data on our data estate? And this, to me, I, I mapped it onto completeness. Uh, accurate, accurate. that's the same thing. Credible refers to integrity. We then have reliable, um, that knowledge is highly trusted. And we would get that through uh, a reflection of the real world. If, if we have, have got a good link to our real world, then that's great. Um, we've then also got unbiased, unbiased knowledge. We know what that is. We, we're not clouded by old ways of thinking. All, all logical biases, so our, our logic is flawed. And then we've got flawless, which is communicating knowledge, um, opens individuals to criticism. Oh, no, sorry, that's fearless. Okay. Um, knowledge is free from errors or factual errors. That's flawless. And then we've got um, the next one, which is fearless. So we, we shouldn't be concerned about um, criticism or people questioning our knowledge that we put down. So individuals should be able to bring their ideas and they shouldn't be controlled by the expert. They should be able to ask those questions. Um, wise, and there we spoke about wisdom, so that knowledge is then translated into that, wis that wisdom area and it's got that really high value insight. We've got fresh being currency, so it's up to date. It's, it hasn't reached its half-life. Relevant, reasonableness, that was uh, an interesting mapping that I haven't seen before with, um, with uh, in the DQ, and it, and it refers to the sub-concept, sub refers to consistency with an operational task. Um, so there, there's a whole lot, and I didn't want to spend all the time, but I just wanted to share with you in terms of how you can measure knowledge um, and of there's the high social velocity and adaptable in these different areas. So that was the almost a presentation that I feel our execs should be looking at. But I see your hands up. Did you want to answer some of those questions that I that I was missing? Yeah, I was just thinking about the word integrated. And yeah. I think it's it's maybe a combination of completeness and, and the very simple word integrity. You know, if you think about the database integrity from an, a, a data perspective, you've got no orphans um, right. so, and completeness. So maybe the two of them together uh, could be. So, so what, they, what, they were, what they were defining in uh, integrated was, um, I should have knowledge about every single process that I'm doing and you should be able to access that knowledge from the process. Okay, yeah. So if I, uh, if I think about a, a database that has integrity, I should be able to answer any question um, that I need to ask about the data in that database. 
Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any, any, anyone else, Matsaling? Do you, do you, have you used these uh, knowledge quality dimensions before? Or have you, are you using that within your organization? Not currently, not currently, but what I'm also picking up here uh, is that one, we should not be reinventing the wheel because yeah. when you look at the properties, even with information management, I mean, there are those, um, you know, those, those dimensions that yeah. you've just highlighted that are also quite um, applicable. You know, so it, it's that yeah. to say, you know, let us not reinvent the wheel. However, let's augment where yes. we are falling short. Yeah. That, that's 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 a great observation, and and I mean, and I think we we sort of picking up with this on on die as well, where we say, you know, there's there's quality involved in every single aspect of the DM wheel. So every single area, like knowledge management, must have a quality set of dimensions to it. Um, and how do we bring it in? We've got to see it and map it so that people almost know they they. They, they become comfortable with assessing the quality of any knowledge area, any area, any knowledge area that we have. Yeah, um, Howard, if I may, um, I think I'm on, on mute, yeah. Uh, no, no, you're you fine. Like, we can you hear had you. a slide up that said it was people and culture. And yes. You're, and, we talk about knowledgeable people so it's about getting um their knowledge out of them yes, yes. and you know and, and and I, uh it's just after this one, yeah. Yeah. yeah and i was yeah. i mean it's just um I mean, the words are so right it's about knowledge is about people we talk about knowledgeable people who make decisions and yeah. um, a lot of that's to do with the culture of the organization yes and you know um i'm way past retirement age and i had a fear for all the people who who are leaving the industry and um leaving all their knowledge um they're not leaving it behind they're taking it with them so how do yes. you get that stuff from yeah. all the great gurus that we've got around today um, and retain that for for the the, the next generation of, 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 of people coming into the organization, into data yeah. management and so on, yeah. And, and Johan has just raised a, a very powerful point that is saying that it's also this knowledge is power uh, within this area. So sharing knowledge doesn't always benefit or, or may reduce your power um and and some people like that key man dependency that johannes pointed out and, and they like to be that but you know this is going to go against that we we're, we're trying to get everybody to share yeah and I, I think successful organizations around the world have have grown because they're not afraid to um lose yeah. that key man dependency and and grow i mean it's about seeing a bigger picture um yeah yeah and and thinking less of me and more of um the organization the country the culture yeah yep yep yeah metzeling i think we we sort of have the same situation with information and data management. If, if the culture is not fertile, then our data management will fail as well. And Matsaleng has just said of the ground, the culture yeah. is not yeah. fertile. Uh, it's, uh, and how, how do you influence the culture of the organization so that it will um, respond to and accept um, that change? Uh, yep. change management yeah 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 paul and also th that's um you you raise a point and that's uh, i mean it would i should try to get lex then do appear to to give us a talk on knowledge management um and and he shows you when he builds that digital twin so so can we take the knowledge and bring it into a machine and a digital representation of what we do 
So let's think about it. They use that to test uh, Formula One designs. They use it to test all sorts of new machines and new approaches. They use a digital twin to, to validate that this thing will work. Um, and we should be able to do that uh, to check our procedures and processes. Wouldn't it be nice if we were building a whole lot of policies, procedures and processes that we could actually simulate those processes and see whether people would come out with the right data quality profile at the end of that. Yeah, I think that's uh, exactly that. Um, I was just thinking as you're talking about things like Wikipedia and and those yeah. knowledge bases, just amazing, um, you know, people capturing content and 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 history and information like that. Yeah, uh, would be but, great but, to see businesses drive the same way. No, yeah. now, now this was the interesting thing that that Paul and I spoke about is, if you create the culture within your organisation and you have a way of doing things that's right for you and doesn't lead you into trouble. You almost have to get people away from doing that quick look up on Google to say, how do I do this? You know, uh, give me the, the top 10 tips of doing a data quality profile. You know, <laughs> how do I do this and how do I go, where do I go to, to get that within the organization? Because sometimes doing it just the wrong way or building a warehouse in the, in the wrong way. You know, how do we build a bridge, a USS bridge? Those are the type of things that I believe we can we can improve. Over to you, Mr. Bolton. Thanks, Howard. Yeah, I was just I was just had a pause there. Sorry, because I was thinking about a conversation I had with uh, a chap called Vivian um, today, and we were just talking about that. Um, I asked him how it went with with dealing with a. Um, a data modeling scorecard that we yeah. that we referred him to, and they hadn't got to it yet. But the point was is is that you know, we were just talking about the specialists um, using the tool, and 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 at, at the same time, the almost like the dependency or the the relevance of training and yeah. sharing of knowledge, etc. And I I blanked out names and and the company, but I showed him those that that mean the jump from 30 odd percent up to over 70 percent just after four days of, of data literacy training or data management fundamentals training and how just that transfer of knowledge has that leap and bound improvement in terms of literacy and so you know if if if, if organizations aren't also driving training and have a heart for training and just say no people can just read a book or or um you know, as you said, go to Google, check a YouTube video. Um, that should be sufficient. And he also agreed. He said that's just it's actually rubbish. You can't. It does. Yes, you can do all those things, and there's lots of validity there. But you can't. You can't discount proper training, organized training, because and those statistics that that you've put together from that from that from those groups just prove the point of that knowledge transfer um, coming right. through. So. Um, yeah, because because like I said, Tim, sorry, um, the specialist that would be rating the models, the data models using the scorecard, um, do they actually like firstly know how to use it, and second of all, are they using a form of of scoring? And yeah. uh, you know, we 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 typical beasts, we always go least resistance. So bad practice <laughs> is well, yeah. quite a common practice. Um, Anyway, we just had a great conversation around that, and this knowledge management, knowledge bank, and and retaining knowledge, is is so critical. Shucks, man. Yeah, yeah. And then I, I think it's chapter. I'm not sure whether it's chapter or Mona. He, he asked a question of of um, talking dollars to a business head. Um, you got to get the buy-in. So how do we show dollars in in knowledge management now? Uh, it is. It is all about what we ref, what we have, and I think it's a change management thing. Of of when we talk about a data people gap, um, we we're saying that we want our people to be able to. Well, we as a company, we have the strategy, but we don't have the right people to get us there. The right people and the right uh, the right people is the wrong term. We don't have the people with the right skills to get us there. 
we we may need to in a lot of these days, especially with data science, you you actually that unicorn actually exists as specialists within your organization that can pick up data science uh, algorithms. They, they tend to be the best people for the job. So how can we how can we get them to a point where they're able to apply their business knowledge to a data science uh, and a data science technique to get the answers that they're looking for. So, so the measurement to me is is the speed at which someone you can take someone and get them to master a technique, uh, and and that would it's as simple as that. How long does it take? Now, and and then keep a consistency across the, within the organization to keep reaching that strategy and not to fall over. So it is about um, seeing the benefit and, and the speed at which you can take people to the point. And I think it's similar to that of, it's easier to um, maintain an existing customer than it is to get a new one. And surely it's easier and more beneficial to maintain an existing employee than to get a new one uh, with all that knowledge that people have. But, but it's about, as, as you say, um, chapter on one eight, you it is about how do we how do we measure it and how do we show them the value of the knowledge that we have? But I think after a while it, it should become visible. You know the the search experience, the machine learning, that interpretation should be be, be start to become visible within the organization. I don't know if that answers your question, Mone. Yeah, thank you for that, Howard. I think uh, it, it's money. Um, I think uh, okay. there is a component that can also be argued that knowledge management can become a cost to to an organization sure. Um, sure. For, from a maintenance point of view. But then it's the, the other way that you're looking at it. If it becomes a cost, how do you flip it that becomes then that you can start an measuring it from an income point of view as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. An asset, you know, so that we 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 can get the competitive advantage that, that people talk about, that's the definition. I, I can I can continue to innovate, I can continue to get the competitive advantage, or and, and I can continue with our strategy. Ty? Uh, thanks, Howard. You know, um, about 20 years ago, data quality was not sexy. You know, nobody <laughs> was interested in data quality. And it was only when we linked it to the business benefits and, mm. um, business and value, yeah. it's the same with I mean I am oh, so yes. excited about this stuff um, this knowledge management and I think uh, knowledge management would be a far better name for it on the Dama Dimbok wheel I would yeah, be excited about content. that yeah <laughs> I mean yeah. what's this document and content you know <laughs> let's raise it up a level um so I think, yeah. and if we can link it to real business benefits, yeah, then we'll agree. see the rewards. Yeah. yeah, it's been a great session, Howard. You've you've sold me on this lot. Yeah, Fantastic. over the last. That's what I wanted to do. Yeah. Any any other votes for knowledge management? <laughs> we want it on the Dumbok wheel. Paul, I think you need to take care. Great. Thank you, everybody. Have a lovely evening. See you next week. All righty. Thanks, Howard. Great session, man. Thank you. Thanks, man. Great session. Thank you. Great session. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Howard.